الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أيها الأخوة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Praise be to Allah We praise him We send peace and prayers and we find our Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم ونسأل الله تعالى أن يغفر لنا ذنوبنا ويكفر عنا سيئاتنا نسألوا بعلم النافع ورزق واسع وعمل صالح متقبلة وعليه نتوكل وإليه المصير ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد As we ask Allah to forgive us to guide us have his mercy upon us We ask Allah for beneficial knowledge and understanding and right sustenance and we depend utterly on him and uh, we ask Allah to accept our from his good deeds and we depend utterly on him and to him is our goal and there is no power and might except of Allah so we come uh, it seems the last session it's been a long uh, time coming I think in February it will be two years but obviously we've had breaks in between but uh, almost that, that time uh, with uh, the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so last time for those of you who are here, you are here we left uh, the story at the juncture after Hajjatul Wada the farewell Hajj and the sermon of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after doing the Hajj just to remind us that uh, on the uh, day of Arafah, the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, uh, when the Prophet delivered the famous sermon, after that was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. This day I have uh, perfected your religion or your way of life for you. Wa Akmamtu Alaykum Ni'mati and completed my favor and bounty upon you. Wa Raditu Lakum Al Islam Adina. And I'm pleased I've chosen for you uh, Islam as a way of life, as a religion. Submission and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was revealed then. And in the days of uh, Tashriq, Ayyam al-Tashriq in Mina, before the Prophet completed his Hajj, was the revelation of Surah An-Nasr, which I mentioned to you before as well, on a few occasions, uh, which uh, as Sahaba like Umar bin Khattab, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum, uh, anhuma, and Ibn, Ab Ibn Abbas knew that this was indicating the finality of his mission and the death would be near. They understood that to an extent, except Umar, which we'll find why. Uh, but certainly those were the indications there, and uh, some of the Sahaba understood that, not all. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Hajj is complete and uh, the new year is the 11th year of Hijrah and uh, Muharram and then uh, Safar, uh, Rabi al Awwal and Rabi al Thani. Um, Prophet ﷺ came back um, in the month of uh, Safar only a month or so after returning he made ready uh, a military detachment to send it towards the Sham where the Battle of Mu'ta had taken place and Tabuk had already taken place where there was no show up for Tabuk if you remember but Mu'ta before that when uh, there was the martyrdom of Jafar ibn Abi Talib Jafar ibn Abi Talib um, uh, Zaid ibn Haritha and Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Khalid ibn Walid brought the rest of the believers back uh, but it wasn't really a victory in a sense for the believers victory was that they managed to escape without all of them without all of them being perished but the Byzantine border lines were obviously still at war with the Prophet Sallallahu they weren't happy with what was going on and that had to be dealt with 
and guarded. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke of detachments of around 3,000 fighters, amongst them were senior Sahaba, including Abu Bakr and Umar, it is said, initially, certainly. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the commander Usama ibn Zayd, who was around 18 years of age now. And there were murmurings and complaining that came to the ear of the Prophet And the Prophet responded, he said, confirming that Usama is the best choice. But the people who complained, we had similar complaints when I chose his father to be in charge as well, with the Ghazwatu Mu'ta. Uh, and it's the same kind of complaint because the, the idea was, of course, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, his father, was a freed slave. That was what the murmurings were. And now we come to the, even though he was freed and they were like an adopted son to the Prophet, now it's his son, again from the lineage of what they saw, the murmurers, as freed slave lineage. So the Prophet confirmed that that was, he countered that the whisperings and ideas which are negative and he is being young as well only 18 as senior people are there but the Prophet Sallallahu confirmed that that's how he wants it and that how much he loved Usama just as he loved his father because Usama thought him like a grandson so that was in regards to that um, the Prophet Sallallahu um, uh, fell ill towards the end of that month uh, and it is said, the majority said that illness lasted about between 10 and 14 days, 10 and 13 days, his illness. And um, uh, his illness uh, seems to have started in the form of a severe headache and then changed with it to a fever and he continued his illness. And we don't know exactly what the illness was. Some mention in Bukhari in reports that the Prophet said he was still suffering the after effects of the poison he was given at Khaybar. Uh, we don't know what the link is with that. It's very difficult to say. Um, and we just say, Allah Alam. But the point is, he was ill. And um, the Prophet initially seems was in the house of Maymuna uh, when his uh, severe headache and illness started uh, and in one report it mentions how he visited also the apartment of Aisha Umm al-Mu'min Aisha, ta, Aisha ta radiallahu anha and um, when he went to visit her on this occasion uh, she went wow, wow, I've got a headache he said, Aisha, you've got a headache. I've got a really bad headache. Yeah. Uh, that's mentioned in a uh, hadith. Um, and this, he returned, it uh, mentions to, it seemed like Maimuna's house. So there is some difference of opinion amongst ulama as to whose house he was at this stage when the illness started. Uh, but the illness didn't go, the headache and the, and the fever then uh, developed. And the Prophet also, um, I should mention before the illness started, the Prophet uh, around this time visited the, uh, the, the, the graves Islam, of the, the martyrs of Uhud and prayed Janazah prayer there with the Sahaba. And one of the reporters from the Sahaba said as though he was doing farewell. So they see the farewell, a uh, goodbye, was an indication of to the living was the Hajj. Bringing Allah to witness. Have I de delivered? I mean, it's, if you see in the reports, in the hadith, it's very clear what he's doing. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this, this uh, the, the reporter of the hadith says it's like farewell to the, the shuhada. Uh, and some say because he didn't get opportunity to do the their uh, their uh, uh, Salatul Janazah before, so he came back to do it at this stage. There's some mention in some reports about him going to do uh, du'a at, uh, at the uh, graveyard in Medina, but he.
he did that on other occasions as well, so it's very possible that he did that at this around this time as well. Sallallahu So anyway, his illness, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, initially, despite his illness, was still going to perform the Salah in, in the Masjid, leading the prayer. Illness got worse, and as it got worse, it seemed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asking who's whichever wife's house he was at with a other, few other wives gathered as to who was on the road to from his wives the next day but he was in a fever kind of state and who was after that he didn't want to say it openly that's what the ulama say so he's indirectly the wives understood that he was indicating that he wanted to be taken care of in the house of Aisha, Aisha radiallahu anha all of them, they gave their days to Aisha as well now for the Prophet to be cared for over there. But they, they were going in and out as well and, and looking after with her. It's not that they just carried on in there. Uh, we don't get that uh, idea at all. So the Prophet was taken by Abbas and Ali, uh, because he couldn't walk at this stage. He was uh, so bad with the, the illness and the fever. Uh, from uh, the house of one of the wives of to the apartment of Aisha anha. and that's where he stayed for the rest of the illness Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha anha, she says that uh, she would as other wives as well that she would take his own blessed hand and put it on his, rub it on his body, and she would recite Al Mu'awwizatain, Kulaudu bi Rabbi Falak and Kulaudu bi Rabbi Nas, on the Messenger of Allah. So he should use his blessed uh, hand on his own body rather than her hand. Uh, and that's mentioned in the authentic hadith as she was looking after him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger of Allah. Um, As I said, he was uh, uh, leading the uh, the prayer. Um, however, uh, it got to a situation where he led one of the days, and this is probably a week or so before uh, the f uh, his final uh, passing away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, he prayed the Maghrib prayer just about, but for Isha time, he was still in a feverish state and quite ill. So he'd come round every now and then and say, has the prayer been done? Has the prayer been done? And he said, no, they're still waiting for you, Aisha. The Prophet Wasallam, on two or three occasions at this juncture tried to get them to pour cold water on him so that he would break and try to get up to go, but he couldn't in the end. So he said to uh, Aisha, anha, Tell your father, tell Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. So now there was a bit of to and fro, and it seems Hafsa was there as well, so there's indication other wives that were there at times. And uh, Aisha says, um, Don't make my father Abu Bakr do it, because people may get a bit weary, because he's very soft and he's got a soft voice, and he's he. He's recited, he hasn't got a loud voice, and he starts crying when he recites. So she, that's the reason she gave. The Prophet repeated the same thing. Tell Abu Bakr to lead them in prayer. With no discussion. And it came back again, this from Aisha. And the third time again, with Hafsa this time, trying to convince him, please. That's what I tell Umar. So the Prophet now, was clear what he was saying. He says, you are, I told you, go and tell Abu Bakr to lead them in prayer. You are like the women around Yusuf, Islam. meaning you're plotting your own ideas and you keep on, <laughs> so I've told you to go and do something, end of it, basically. So, which is what uh, uh, exactly happened. And Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, he, uh, led the believers in prayer in the masjid. Um, 
the Prophet ﷺ, of course, coming in and out of his fever and his uh, consciousness and unconsciousness, he was praying himself in his state that he was in, uh, not in the masjid but in the apartment. Whether he was sitting or lying, that's how his prayers continued. Um, then it seems um, around five days or so before his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he seemed to perk up. The fever seemed to break. He seemed to feel a bit better, a, a bit better, but not completely better. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam managed then, with the help of uh, the Sahaba and a, a, a cloth tied around his head for the headache, he managed to turn up for the prayers turn up for some days for the prayers again and as he came for the first uh, one of, of these which is as I said about five days before the death of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, the Sahaba were overjoyed and they were in prayer when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived and they couldn't help because obviously there's a worry around the whole of Medina the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seriously ill uh, and they couldn't help noticing him coming out of the apartment so there's a, a kerfuffle during Salah so Abu Bakr feels and knows what can the kerfuffle meant basically and as the Prophet Sallallahu was brought eventually past the, the Musalleen to near the front Abu Bakr radiallahu an realized what was going on and uh, and as he saw the Prophet Sallallahu he tried to move back allow the Prophet Sallallahu to lead the prayer but the Prophet Sallallahu kept him put his hand on his shoulder told him to stay there Prophet Sallallahu he asked the people who were helping him to sit the Prophet Sallallahu down on the left side of Abu Bakr not on the right so who was going to lead the Prophet Sallallahu because the leader is always on the Muaddin if there's two of you the Muaddin stands on the right yeah so the Prophet ﷺ did lead actually. Some people don't clarify that, you don't see it so clear in the Sira writings. But in Hadith in Bukhari it clarifies that the Prophet ﷺ, yeah, for a few days then led the prayer sitting down because he wasn't able to stand up. And Abu Bakr would say Allahu Akbar after him loudly like uh, so that they can hear at the back. Yeah, so Abu Bakr is following but Abu Bakr will be standing and the Muslim was standing. Which is contrary to what happened earlier. If you remember when he spent his 50 days away from his wives and he was fallen off a horse and he was injured, he was also praying sit, sitting down. But at that time, he told the Sahaba to follow the Imam. Meaning if he was sitting down, they should sit down and pray. Now, that became abrogated. Because what he did at the last illness was he stayed sitting and the Sahaba remained standing. Which is which is what we keep with them. So that's why a difference of opinion amongst ulama. But those who follow this, they say they became mansukh here. Prophet Sallallahu led sitting while in his illness, but the rest of the Sahaba, including Abu Bakr, remained standing uh, for, for the prayer, where it was necessary to stand, obviously. Uh, so the, after the first time he came back, when illness seemed to improve and everybody was happy, he took to the member to talk to the Sahaba. And here he said a few things to them, sallallahu alayhi wa um, One of the things he said, he said, I am a, a predecessor. I will be one before you. Ana, inni faratukum. I am the one going before you and you are going to follow me. And he said, we will meet your meeting with me, your promised place will be at the holes, at the fountain. At the fountain. Uh, fountain of Kawthar. So our meeting will be there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's one of the things he said to them. And he also said that a servant has been given a choice. He can either have the, uh, the wonders and uh, 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 wonders and uh, bounties of this world or he can return back to his Lord 
and a servant has decided to turn back to his Lord. A servant, you can put it across that way. So everybody, Abu Bakr started crying. So they say, I mean, Sahaba say, you realize what Abu Bakr realized that this servant was himself he's talking about. The others were saying, some were saying, why is the old man crying for? He's just telling about servant. But Abu Bakr realized that the servant was himself. Because he's been given the choice and he's made his choice. Abu Bakr knew from then that, that this was imminent now. So that's why he started crying. And two more things he said, which are reported in a few hadith, but you can tell they're from the same sermon that he delivered at this time. He said, as for Abu Bakr, the person who's most sacrificed for me, for love for me, of themselves, of their life and wealth, is Abu Bakr. And he said, if I was to choose لَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا خَلِيلًا لَأَتَّخَذْتُ أَبَا بَكْرَ If I was to choose a Khalil, and it's translated as friend, but Khalil is very difficult to translate. Khalil is more than a friend. It's, uh, it's the dearest, most loving person. If I was to choose that most dearest loving person in the world, I would have chosen Abu Bakr. But... Allah, I've mentioned this to you before, but Allah has taken me as his Khalil, as he took Ibrahim as his Khalil. Yeah. But, uh, but my, uh, uh, my uh, companionship and love for him, and my uh, 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 meaning, that's what I cherish. And the Prophet ﷺ said, after me, close all the doors to the leading to the mosque except the door of Abu Bakr. Let that remain open. Uh, and also the Prophet ﷺ said, and one of the Sahaba reporting this, they said, that's the last time I saw the Messenger of Allah alive. He said, um, Lestu uh, akhafa alaykum and um, and tushriku billahi shay'a. I'm not afraid from you uh, that you will do shirk again after I've gone. But what I'm fear for you is dunya. Fatanafasa, yeah. fatanafasuha, and that you'll compete for dunya after I'm gone. In other words, that's what's going to destroy you. Yeah. How true. So he's warning before he goes, that's what I worry for you. Not that you're going to do shirk again, because that shirk has been wiped away. Tawheed became established firmly, and the Prophet was sure of that. But that you will run after dunya, and you'll compete each other for it. Like those who competed for it before you. And it destroyed them, <coughs> in one version, that's what he said, but it destroyed them like it will destroy you. So that's a warning to them. Not that you, not that inevitably it's going to happen, so you don't put your fold your arms and say, oh, well, he said it's going to happen, isn't it? So there you are, I'm one of the... <laughs> That's not the point. The message is, don't do it. Yeah. Don't fall for it. Even of those around you falling for it, don't you fall for it. So the Prophet saw some, this was uh, a, a, a very uh, tender sermon, also a promise of meeting at the Fountain of Hope. At the, at, the, at the fountain of Kawthar, the hole uh, of Kawthar, uh, with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, our meeting will be there, as he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, Messenger of Allah, um, in these last few days, he also um, made sure there was a few coins that he had. Made sure Aisha radhiallahu anha distributed them to the poor. Uh, he had nothing left. Anything of his possessions he had, like the white mule or any garments, his armor was all distributed and given away. Given away. Um, and some lands that, any lands he had were also distributed and given away in charity. So, so much so that Umm al Mu'minah Aisha, she mentions that there was nothing left. So she had to go and get something and she had to borrow it 
in the last couple of days, there was nothing. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam owned nothing uh, uh, in that sense. Um, so, um, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam freed any slaves that he had. Yeah. And um, he, um, when it um, came to the um, morning, the Fajr, of the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, Monday the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, and by the way on the 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal today, it's in three days time, <laughs> we do know the death date of Rasulullah um, So on the Monday the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, the Prophet Sallallahu his fever seemed to break again, but this time break and he seemed to be fresh and you know uh, li uh, livened as it were so he got up and it, it seemed to be momentary he got up that morning and the fajr prayer was already going on so he looked out of the apartment and he was smiling big smile as he saw the sahaba praying he didn't have enough strength to actually go and join them but the Sahaba noticed him at the entrance, those who could see him, because the entrance of uh, Aisha's apartment is straight into the masjid. So those who could see him, they were, as he said in the report, that, you know, in the prayer, they were like this. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and they were overjoyed. They thought, oh my goodness, he's recovered. Yeah, They were hoping he'd come and join, but he couldn't get there. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, he was still very weak and stayed uh, in the apartment and very soon he was lying as he spent most of his illness uh, as Umm al-Mu'mini Aisha uh, says that he spent most of his illness and she found that as so honourable that he, his head was in my lap or it was on my chest uh, during the illness and uh, so it became again. Um, but it seems that uh, revival, as it seemed for a few hours, was very momentary. It was just before actual the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, either that day or a day or two before, we don't know precisely, but it seemed very near the time. He'd asked for, and Fatima is obviously the only daughter left now, so she was obviously constantly visiting her father as well, uh, uh, living at uh, uh, Ali's place. And, and that particular day, uh, Umm al-Mu'minin Aisha anha noticed that when she used to come, she said she used to withdraw a little bit, give father and daughter time together. And one of those occasions, she was watching and she noticed him whispering something to Fatima, which made her weep. And then he whispered very quickly after that something, and she started crying. Uh, she started uh, laughing even in her weeping. So both at the same time, as it were. But uh, when Mu'mini Aisha Radhana asked her about this much later, after the death of Rasulullah, so what did he say to you? That made you laugh first, uh, uh, cry first, and then uh, and then uh, um, laugh. She said, "He, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, my father. He said that I'm not going to recover from this illness. You know, I'm going to die. That's why she started crying." He said, "But you know, the first person from my family who will follow me in death is you." And she started laughing. I was just thinking about that. And I was thinking, why would be anybody be happy of being told that they're going to die? Yeah. And if this man came for this world for secular reasons, in an imposter, why would he give news like that to somebody? That you're going to die after me, as though it was good news. You understand what I'm saying? Imposters for world don't do things like that. They don't say, oh, by the way, good news is you're following me to death. <laughs> to think, well, there's no hereafter. What am I, 
Hey, mate, I don't want to follow you to death, even if you're a daughter or son, do you? And, and this is, again, his truthfulness. Look at the message he's brought. The message of truth, that there is really a hereafter. Yeah. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, when the Prophet وسلم, and these hadith are in Bukhari Muslim, when the Prophet وسلم, used to be well, before his final death, he used to say, I remember, she said, that no prophet, no prophet perishes or dies until he's shown ma'adihi fil jannah, his place in paradise, he's shown it. And then thumma khuyyara, then he's given a choice from Allah. Choice, choice what? Whether to go now or go later. Then he's given a choice to make. Uh, and so, then she goes, Umbul Mu'mineen Aisha, she says, in his uh, last day, the Prophet وسلم, was once again in my, uh, he was on my chest, um, just about conscious, very ill with fever. And um, my brother came, Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman was passing by and came. Um, and he had um, a, a new stick, or they used to use for siwak, yeah, for brushing the teeth. And so he had it with him. And I noticed from the message of Allah that he seemed from his appearance the way he was looking that he wanted it so I got it from Abdurrahman she said anha. she goes and because it's a new stick I chewed to make the one side of it soft the head of it soft so he could use it and I passed it to him and he took it and he cleaned his teeth in an excellent manner really well And um, she, um, he still had the stick. So if you bring the other hadith, uh, hadith together around this juncture, what was happening, he said, I noticed the Prophet وسلم, then look to the ceiling of my apartment, saying, in the company of the, the righteous and the prophets, in the company of the Most High. And she said, I remembered then what he used to say when he was well. And I said to myself, he's made his choice. And she was upset. But I said to myself, she said, he's chosen, hasn't he? Because he heard those words from him. And he kept on saying. And, and his a voice was, he's saying now become weak, but I could hear what he was uh, saying. Labored. Uh, and he kept repeating, Fi uh, Rafiq al A'la, uh, in the company of the Most High. Um, and also, he was saying some of the last things he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seems in the last couple of days at least, which is mentioned in Abu Dawood as well, he kept, As Salat, As Salat. He repeated that a few times. Salah, Salah, reminding. Yeah. Don't forget your Salah, in other words. Don't forget your Salah. And what your right hands possess, meaning the slaves, but its meaning can be wider than that. All your responsibilities that you have, basically. Because you're going to be asked about these things. So this was a a, a thing that was coming out the Prophet uh, mouth in, in his uh, uh, last laboured uh, 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 breaths Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu also uh, final thing before the it seems the, 
the, the suwak sticky had fell out of his hand and he breathed his last oh. on her chest, yeah. وسلم, that he took, there was a basin of water, she said, near him, he took some uh, hands full of it and put it over his face and said, Allahumma gfirli, warahamni, oh Allah, forgive me, yeah, have mercy on me. Uh, as well as saying, uh, uh, saying, La ilaha illallah, Allahumma or, uh, uh, and, um, and as he's saying that, and then saying, in the company of the Most High, he breathed his last saying those words, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as the Prophet Sallallahu had passed away, the news traveled, so his wives came, they were crying, and as was uh, uh, all Ummahat al Mu'mineen. And uh, uh, the family were, uh, were, were present. Um, the news traveled, Usama came from the uh, military uh, encampment, which was just on the outskirts of Medina when the news came, and he came and uh, he's like grandson, he came and he kissed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the news travelled so that Omar came <coughs> before Abu Bakr Omar came and when they said this Omar became really emotional obviously everybody knows the story of Omar, what he became like then he used to say afterwards, I used to think that he was always going to be around because the Quran said as like um, in the Quran says in a couple of places uh, that uh, yeah, you are uh, the witnesses upon human beings and the messenger, messenger of Allah is a witness upon you so he was thinking this is Sahaba we are witnessing the truth to the rest of humanity as he is a witness meaning he'll be present with us <laughs> That's what he he certainly wanted to believe. Yeah. And emotion overtook him. And he said, no, he's not died. He's not died at all. He was making a big commotion. Because he took his sword and said, anybody who says is Muhammad's dead, I will chop their head off myself. So big commotion. People are coming and gathering around. Omar listening to what he's saying. Saying, he's not died. He's just, his spirit has left. He's gone on a journey, he'll be back, and then he'll be up and about again, as it happened before. Uh, so that's the commotion going on outside. Short while later, while all this commotion is going on outside, Abu Bakr, he arrives. He sees all the commotion outside the apartment of Aisha with Omar, shouting and bawling. So he walks straight past them, goes into the apartment, and pulls the sheet back, kisses the forehead of the Messenger of Allah, and says, May my mother and Father be May my mother and father be sacrificed with me, O oh, Messenger of Allah. You can't imagine it, can we? You can only have a little bit of the story. He kissed his forehead and said that. He said, Allah has given you the death and there will be no more death for you now after this for the fear of God. But yeah, that's what one of the things the Prophet Sallallahu said when he said, La ilaha illallah, he said, surely death has its pangs and its pains. Inna al mawta fiya sakarat. You see, even he had to go through Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then, Abu Bakr gently covers his face after he kissed and he leaves to go outside and as he's go and can't go out he says Umar be quiet and sit down Umar doesn't listen so Abu Bakr calls and addresses the people himself away from there so as he starts speaking the people leave Umar and they start listening to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and and um, and these are all Sahaba, I remember. They're all emotional, they're overcome. They can't believe what they're hearing. So Abu Bakr, after praising Allah, 
he says, for those who worship Muhammad, know that Muhammad is dead. And for those who worshipped Allah, know that Allah is ever living and eternal, will never die. And this is his famous address, and he reminded them what Allah SWT says in the Quran. And that was a ayah that was revealed in Uhud, when it was thought the Prophet SAW had been killed, if you remember, in Ghazwat al Uhud. And he recited it. Abu Bakr said, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمُ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِمَّا تَأَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَطِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَذُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا فَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ So he recited the ayah which said Muhammad is no more than a messenger مَا مُحَمَّدُ إِلَّا رَسُولُ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ other messengers who've been and gone before him. Qad Khalad means they died and perished as well. They're not around still. Qad Khalad means Qablihi Rusul. If he was to die or to be killed, are you going to turn back on your heels? Know that whoever turns back on their heels, meaning away from the faith again, into apostasy and back to wrong. They will not harm Allah in any way. Which means they'll harm themselves. For surely Allah will give reward, grant reward for those who are grateful. Grateful here means those who continue to have Iman in the context of the ayah. Yes? Shakir is the one who continues to show gratitude despite the death of the Messenger of Allah. They continue to believe and thank Allah for sending the guidance through him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this, Ibn Abbas reports later and uh, Umar bin Khadr, as though many of the Sahaba, as though they've never heard it before. It was like it was just being revealed then. It had been revealed before, but they'd forgotten. And uh, it's said that many of the Sahaba who were around started repeating this ayah to remind and tell others as it were. Yes. So what happens is as the uh, family get busy with uh, preparations for the Prophet Sallallahu for his uh, ghusl, uh, janazah, what happens, etc. And his burial will come to. But it's very soon after the death, Omar finds out and he tells Abu Bakr once he's calmed down now and, and, realize, and then he realized again where he is and where Abu Bakr is, even in the understanding, isn't he? You know what he always, you know, Omar is a very strong character, but how he feels in front of Abu Bakr, well, this confirms it even more. You know, look at his emotional understanding and outburst, which was against reality, and Abu Bakr who came to calm the whole situation down. And Omar finds out that the Ansar are meeting in one of the nearby halls, big uh, uh, homes. The leaders and seniors of the Ansar are meeting. What for? Because they're discussing, we need to, you know, the prophets died, some of the fire said, we have to get somebody who's in charge of the, the city. Yeah, before chaos breaks, breaks loose. And it seems the most likely candidate for them was Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Remember the two Sa'ads? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah from the Khazraj. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was from the Aus. They were from the leadership of the uh, Aus and Khazraj. Khazraj was the tribe of, obviously, uh, also Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the uh, hypocrite uh, leader. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was ill. He was wrapped in a blanket and he was laid in the middle of the discussion place where the, all this discussion was going on. As they're about... The discussion started, but Omar convinces Abu Bakr, he says, we have to go there, you know, before, you know, this nation ends up in disaster situation. So he convinces him, 
he and one or two other Athenian companions, they go together to this place. As they walk in, one of the, one of the Ansars making the address. So he, they welcome them because they're like their brothers. They have great regard for them. So he makes the address, the Ansar, praising the Ansar and their position and praising the Muhajireen as well. But not quite getting to it, it seemed that the candidate was Sa'd ibn Ubadah and he was going to be elected. So Omar couldn't hold himself back anymore. He tried to get up, but Abu Bakr stopped him. Abu Bakr stood up and spoke after praising Allah. And he mentioned about the, uh, the, uh, the virtues of the Ansar. To show no animosity or how great they were, etc. And but he said, when it comes to leadership, now you're talking about it's not just Medina, you're talking about the Arabian Peninsula. And the Arabs, they're still coming out newly out of Jahiliya. They will never accept a leader at this stage except from the Quraysh. You know that. Yeah. So there's uh, a, a discussion to and fro going on. And um, Abu Bakr, he basically lifts the hand of Omar and says, and I would present to you this person as a candidate to be the leader. <laughs> Omar can't believe it. <laughs> so as, as uh, there's to and fro discussion going on still, as uh, Abu Bakr is trying to get him to be, uh, to, to, to be given allegiance to and be the, the Khalifa, uh, Omar suddenly stands up in the middle of all this and says, and whoever's with him, I think is Ab uh, Abu uh, Ubaidah Abu ibn al-Jarrah, I think, if I remember correctly, is with him from the Muhajirin as well. And uh, Omar suddenly stands up and so does Abu Ubaidah uh, ibn al-Jarrah, and they put their hand on the hand of Abu Bakr and says, and we give allegiance to Abu Bakr. <laughs> right? No more talking discussion. So that's what happens. And after them, the Ansar start one after the other, all giving allegiance uh, to uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, anhu, and uh, he is given uh, allegiance and, and becomes the Khalifa. And now he goes back and addresses later on the rest of the congregation in the masjid on the member because they're not all there. And, uh, of course, the rest of the, those who were gathered in this meeting come and tell everybody else and encourage everybody to give bayah to him. And everybody gives bayah their allegiance. Uh, and uh, it's said, I don't know how true it is, Abu uh, uh, Sa'd ibn Ubadah didn't give bayah. I don't know what the truth about it is. I haven't found it any clear, authentic hadith that he migrated to the Sham. Ali Radilawan seems he didn't give bayah straight away. And that is mentioned in the hadith. But he did give it later on, some months later. And he said to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr started weeping and crying. He said, my only qualm was that you'd made the decision we weren't even consulted. Because he wasn't there at the time. And Abbas wasn't there. And, they, and, and I thought that we being kinsmen of Rasulullah so should have had some say at least. Not that we should have been there, but we should have had some say. So Abu Bakr said, I understand, and he started crying and said, I would, want, uh, I would never want to ruin my relationship with the family of Rasulullah Yeah, That relationship is more important to me than the relationship of my own family. Yeah. And so Ali Radawan gave bear at that juncture uh, to uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So, Finally, the Prophet Sallallahu when it came to uh, ghusl, the family gathered, because it was a ghusl we're going to do by the, the family. If they allowed Sahaba in, they would have allowed, nothing would have got done, yeah, in people's emotions and that. Some Sahaba said that they were crying and weeping, and they were crying, and there were, there's some reports were saying they're telling each other, stop crying. And they're crying themselves. <laughs> stop <laughs> stop over, over crying, meaning they didn't want to get into the area of lamenting. So they're telling each other off while they're doing it themselves. <laughs> um, and uh, some of them said, we were crying, not just because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam departed, who we loved more than any, anyone, but also that Wahi had finished, that the heavens have closed. That connection with God, Jibreel coming up and down, 
it's an amazing you think about it but that's gone yeah the revelation had stopped uh, and revelation had its blessing as it's guiding them as it as that's why afterwards you know now they're having to find their own way that's why it felt like to them they've suddenly been unshackled and they felt just totally um like confused initially you could say many were look look at Omar bin Khattab but the, but uh, you had others like Abu Bakr who were there to stabilize and, and show the way so anyway the family gathered they're wondering how to do the ghusl the Prophet Sazam had his clothes on and didn't, didn't want to undress him so he didn't know what to do and a hadith mentioned that some sleep some slumber or sleep for the family members gathered together came over them for a short while and then they came round and then they decided we're going to wash the Prophet Sallallahu with his clothes on which is what they did they didn't un uncover his body Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha famously said had I known what would ensue at the time in regards to the washing and, and doing takfeen uh, a kafan of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the wives we would have done it done it ourselves which shows that it wasn't you know wives weren't stopped from doing the washing the kafan of the husband yeah she said i would have done it we would have done it ourselves had i known the confusion it would have led to because it was initially confusing for them anyhow that's what they did they poured the water over the clothes of rasulullah then they got three sheets of yemeni cloth and they wrapped them yeah no turban and they said no kameez no shirt it was just wrappings three wrappings for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then it came uh, to the janazah prayer which took some period of time because nobody led a janazah prayer for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi you should know but people used to come from the Sahaba in groups of 10 or so pray their janazah prayer where the body of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the apartment and leave this is what they carried on doing then the women did it after that and then the young boys came and did the janazah in groups as well like that so that's how it carried on for a period of time until people had done the janazah prayer and a farewell to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then it came to burial, and the discussion decided again: shall we bury him where his family are buried, etc., and his uh, children, where Ibrahim is buried? But Abu Bakr remembered that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in, in a report that he remembered the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the prophets are buried in the place where they perish, where they died. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had also said in that last sermon he delivered in the mosque before he died five days or so he said people before before you took the the graves of their prophets and righteous people as shrines to worship at do not take my qabr as a shrine to worship okay so anyway so here they decided that it had to be in the apartment of Aisha so the grave had to be dug there now there were two types of graves that they had in those days a Meccan grave and a Medinan grave uh, the a Meccan grave was as we have them today straight down yeah a, a hole that's deep the Medinan grave was down and it was into the side okay so they said which one shall we uh, and the Prophet had already said as well that uh, uh, that the preference was for the grave which goes with the hole and uh, at the side although the other was allowed as well it's not that they didn't, uh, they didn't that's what they did at uh, it seems to offer anyway so they said well the two people i think it was abu ubaid and jarrah was a, 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 no, a grave digger from uh, know about digging graves from um, mecca so he knew about the one that goes to the side and the other was abu talha Abu Talha was the father of um, Anas. Anas, who served the Messenger of Allah's right family as well. So um, they said, call, call them both. Whoever comes first and digs, that's what we'll have. Because they know their trade. So it seems uh, one was uh, Abu Talha came and he uh, dug the one which is straight down and deep. And they placed the body of Rasulullah sallallahu uh, in that and buried him there um, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so this was the leaving of the messenger of Allah from the world he left 
delivering the message, reminding with his last breath always for people to remember where they were going, to not be distracted by the world, gave everything away that he had, owned. Sallallahu yeah. Alaihi Wasallam. And with his departing was the end of revelation, but also the completion of revelation. That's another positive way of looking at it, was the completion of revelation, the completion of the guidance of the Qur'an, which was going to be here till the last day, till Allah SWT decides to take it up. And that message is still with us. And that beautiful, exam beautiful example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, and there is no example like him. I hope those of you who gone on this journey with me in this last nearly two years, and I'm sure you've read it before as well, uh, will have realized that there is no example like him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, what an amazing person. And there is no doubt that he was the finality of prophethood. He was the messenger of God. Uh, and um, uh, in this season, perhaps more than anything else, if we're talking about Mawlid, for his birthday, and anything else is about talking about his status, sallallahu alayhi wa his character, what he brought, what he showed to humanity that was steeped in the dark ages from north, south, east and west. And he shone a light, the brightness of which didn't just go across in his own lifetime across the Arabian Peninsula in the 23 years of Nabuwa and prophethood, but its light has shone well beyond and continues to shine to this day, uh, despite areas of darkness. And uh, that light has reached us. And how fortunate we are, are we not, to have received the rays from that light that he brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are really fortunate if only we would realize. And our realization, appreciation of that light is to take it inside us and let it nurture us. And let that light be the light that guides us. We pray to Allah. We pray to Allah that we are the ones he called his brothers, who he's not met yet. We're not the Sahaba, we can never be. But we pray we are his brothers, who gather at that place we see, we, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the appointed place at the, at the holes, at his hole, the fountain of Kawthar. So we can drink from his blessed hand, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And anyone who drinks at that time from his blessed hand, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will never go thirsty again. Oh, what a position to be in, brothers and sisters. And that time is not far away. Uh, and let me finish with Aisha Dil Anha. I told you what she said about the toothbrush. With, that's the last thing she gave him. She used to say that my saliva mixed with the saliva through the toothbrush of the messenger of Allah before he, just before he breathed his last. What have I said to you always? To touch him, to touch him, or have your saliva mixing with his is to be given paradise. To touch him with any negativism or harm or hatred in your body is to be given the bad news of hellfire. That is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we say, finally, Inna Allahu malaikatahu yusallu na ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa barik ala Muhammad. Wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta wa barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Indaka hamidun majid. وآخر دعوانا للحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين